So today I will be talking about one-on-one geodynamic modeling and I'm going to apply that to subduction. And um, well, I am the person giving this seminar, but uh, I had a lot of help from uh, my great little team uh, and here are all their names. So I just want to start with that and explain where uh, this talk comes from really. So this is the team. Um, we wrote a paper together on geodynamic modeling. It's an introduction paper to geodynamic modeling if you're interested in starting out or revisiting uh, some of the basic principles and uh, basically uh, some kind of resource that we wanted to provide for the community. And um, yeah, like I said, we've did, we did this as very much a team effort. So we have Fabio here, Adina, Anna, Juliana, and Cedric. And um, if you want to have a look at it, or if you want to give us feedback and help with improving the paper, it's currently an open discussion on solid earth. So um, if you're interested, check it out. And then um, I'm basically going to run you through the main points of geodynamic modeling. What is a geodynamic modeling study? And in order to illustrate it better, I would like to show you my own research that I've been conducting for the past year or so as a postdoc in Leeds, which I've been doing uh, in collaboration with Tim Craig, who uh, if you know Comet, you might know he's been in Comet for a while, and uh, also Cedric. And that research is focused on thermal modeling of subduction zones. So we get the title, 101 Geodynamic Modeling Applied to Subduction. Okay. Um, if at any point uh, there is any relevant contributions of specific team members, I will point them out and try to um, highlight them a bit. So to all start on the same page, let's discuss what geodynamics is. Well, it's kind of in the name. It is the dynamics of the earth. And then more specifically, it's looking at physics and the forces specifically acting on the earth and the subsequent deformation. So as a little illustration, here we have a figure of all the scales that are at play. So here we have the different time scales from seconds to billions of years. And here we have spatial scales from millimeters to kilometers. And all these processes that you see listed here are either geodynamical processes or they are heavily related to geodynamical processes. So here we have mantle convection and lithosphere deformation and crustal deformation. And uh, the geodynamics that we discuss in this talk and in the paper as well, mainly focuses on these uh, principles really, but all these other processes have a bearing on that uh, outer core dynamics, but also earthquake dynamics, because earthquakes in the end, uh, especially for lithospheric deformation are what uh, facilitate the large scale movements, right? So all these different skills are at play. And um, that's already kind of tricky because uh, there is very large uh, changes in these scales. And um, well, it's difficult to, to deal with that. Of course, if we are interested in the lithosphere and the mantle and what how it behaves and things like that, it's, it's ideal if we could have a look at what happens there, but it's very difficult to do that because it's very deep. Uh, we cannot really get direct observations. So that is why a lot of people turn to modeling and using uh, physics and computers and mathematical models to say something about what happens on depth. And that is how we get to the process of geodynamic modeling. Because we do want to know something, we cannot get direct observations. So maybe models can help us out. And the way I want to describe geodynamic modeling is by conveying to you that it is a whole process. Of course, you're going to start out with nature. There is something interesting that you see, you observe, uh, but then in order to get more insight into that, in geodynamic modeling, you might look at what physics best describes it. And then because those physics are typically too complicated to do just by hand, you are going to make a computer model, a numerical model, that the computer can solve for you. Then, when you have your lovely code, you can have your specific model set up for your research question, check that everything works, analyze it, communicate it, and manage all the data that you have produced in the process. And then, ideally, in the end, you have some kind of scientific advancement. You have created knowledge. <laughs> 
ideally. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to run you through this process step by step. So we're going to see this schematic a uh, bunch of times and I'll illustrate uh, every concept from my own modeling. So let's start with nature. What am I interested in? What is the observation that I found fascinating? Well, I like subduction zones. I think they're very interesting. You have one plate here in a very simple schematic, a subducting plate, usually oceanic, that uh, subducts between an overriding plate. And uh, with this process, a lot of seismicity is paired. In the shallow region, you have shallow seismicity on the megathrust, where you get these big earthquakes, but you can also have earthquakes on the splay folds here and on the outrise folds. If you go a bit deeper, you can have intermediate depth earthquakes at 75 to 300 kilometers, and you can have deep earthquakes even deeper than 300 kilometers. So a lot of people live near these plate boundaries, so the seismicity that occurs in these subduction zones is, is quite significant to have some kind of grasp on, on to understand how it's really working. So therefore, we ask ourselves the question, what controls this seismicity? Well, if you look at these shallow regions, for example, one of the very important factors is the stress buildup, because in the end, that is what creates an earthquake. If the stress buildup due to the convergence of the two plates, for example, is uh, so high that it reaches the strength of the rock, the rock will fail, you will get nucleation and an earthquake. But where this stress builds up and where you can have that, uh, uh, that stress buildup really, depends a lot on the thermal structure of the subduction zone because we do not have brittle deformation everywhere. At some point, uh, when the temperatures are high enough, we go into the ductile regime where we do not have this kind of stress buildup anymore. So the thermal structure of the subduction zone and uh, the brittle ductile transition, which is dictated by the temperatures, is quite important for this uh, mega thrust seismicity because it determines how deep your seismogenic zone can be and hence how large your seismogenic zone can be and hence how big the biggest mega thrust earthquake could be at a certain region. Similarly, for these intermediate depth earthquakes at 75 to 300 kilometers depth, they are usually associated by uh, associated with dehydration reactions. So there's a slightly different mechanism, but people think that it's the dehydration reactions that are responsible for them. And these dehydration reactions occur at a specific temperature and pressure. So again, if you know something about the thermal structure of the subduction zone, you might be able to say something about where you would expect intermediate depth seismicity, which can be very useful. So of course, people know this, people have thought of this, and hence people have done numerical modeling of the temperature field of a subduction zone. This is an example from uh, Van Keken, and you can see here a subduction zone with a, a slab going down, slab is cold, and uh, the seismicity uh, that you would expect here. This is great. However, the previous models that are usually used in these kinds of modeling studies never use temperature dependent parameters. And these uh, parameters, in this case, I will be talking about thermal parameters, include the thermal conductivity, the heat capacity, and the density. Now, this is a very valid simplification for uh, geodynamic models if you are not necessarily interested in the temperature, but lab experiments have shown that actually these thermal parameters do very much depend on temperature. So that got me asking, what is the effect of temperature dependent parameters on the thermal structure of subduction zones? So here we went from something that was quite uh, intuitive, a nice observation of subduction and seismicity, and we narrowed it all the way down to quite a specific modeling question, really. And this is going to be the research question that I'm going to be focusing on and illustrating the general modeling process by. So the effect of temperature-dependent parameters on the thermal structure of subduction zones. Okay, 
Great. We have our research question. Now let's think a little bit about the physics in what we call the physical model. And for the physical model, we have the following equations. And these are very general. Um, so we have the conservation equations, the conservation of mass, the conservation of momentum, and the conservation of energy. And typically, these three conservation equations are used in numerical modeling, also beyond geodynamic modeling. Um, just three very standard uh, conservation equations, really. We need to have some kind of rheology that feeds into the momentum equation. And uh, in our case, we have viscous, elastic, and plastic for geodynamic modeling. Okay, great. So this is the most general form, I would say, of all these equations. But of course, not everything is completely relevant for us. So we're immediately going to simplify it a bit and make some assumptions. First of all, we are going to assume that things are incompressible. The material is incompressible, which is a uh, a valid assumption for uh, the type of modeling we are going to do here, the things we are interested in. Then there is no gravity, so that disappears. We only focus on a viscous rheology. We're not necessarily interested in elastic rheologies or plastic. Plastic in this case, by the way, means um, it's an approximation of brittle rheology. That's the way we use it in geodynamics. But for now, we're only interested uh, in a viscous rheology, keeping it simple. And we're gonna say there is no additional heat sources. So these terms fall out and we're gonna look at steady state. Just one simple uh, steady state temperature field that we're interested in and seeing what the effect would be of adding these temperature dependent thermal parameters. Okay, so we have done the physics uh, and we solve these equations for velocity V here and uh, temperature T. And that's obviously what we're interested in in this particular case specifically. So, great, we have equations. Now, how are we going to solve them? We're not going to solve them by hand because they're due to the rheology. There's a lot of things that depend on each other. So that would be a bit too complicated. We don't want to do that. So we're gonna make a computer model or a numerical model, which basically means that you're using some uh, mathematical uh, functions, well, mathematical methods, uh, and apply that to your equations. So the first thing you need to do is discretizing the equations, because the conservation equations I've just shown basically hold for every location, every time you could imagine. But in a computer, you need to have discrete points at which you look and solve which you look at and solve your equations. So your location or your space, which might be a continuous line, now gets divided into these dots, xi, xi minus one, xi plus one, and the time also becomes discrete. So we introduce a time step delta t to go from one time step to the other. Now, there are various ways of discretizing the equations. Uh, the most common in geodynamics are finite element method, finite difference method, and the finite volume method. Um, and there are pros and cons to all these methods, of course. Uh, but we are going for the finite element method. Why are we going for the finite element method? Let me tell you. So if we do the numerical discretization, I just showed you in 1D space. But if we look at 2D, it would look something like this you would see a mesh. So here you have a very simple uh, square mesh. So all the elements or cells, as they are called, are the same size. And uh, if you have different materials in there, for example, if you want to have some kind of material that is uh, in a circle, a circle with a different material, it's quite difficult to resolve that with your square mesh if you only uh, solve the equations on the mesh nodes. So that's a bit difficult. Of course, there are ways to go around this. For example, you could do mesh refinement. You could split it up into smaller squares and go like that. But still, it's, it's not perfect. You do not really have uh, a nice approximation of your circle here. 
And the finite difference method, for example, is usually confined to these rectangular or square meshes. So it's difficult to have complex geometries with that method if you do not also add in additional numerical methods. The finite element method, however, is a bit more flexible in the terms of the shape of the elements. So it can do these squares, but it can also do triangles. And this is an unstructured mesh, so it's a bit of a mess. Uh, but that does mean that you can capture the interface between two different materials quite well. And because we are interested in a subduction geometry, which is quite complicated with the slab going down and an overriding plate here, you already see that that is a triangle. So we are going to go for a triangle and hence uh, the finite element method is most suited for that. Then some tips for if you want to get into geodynamic modeling and you're going to choose code, best practices, choose an open source code so that everyone can access it. Um, maybe it's a community software project where you can ask for help. Um, it's also nice if you want to publish about it at some point because then it's easily reproducible if people can just go to the code themselves. Secondly, version control, make sure that uh, there is some kind of system in place so that people uh, can collaborate on the code separately, but still you can merge all those changes more or less easily. So uh, check if there's something like that in place. And then if you are going to do some modeling, make sure there is some kind of software management plan. How are you going to deal with the different versions? How are you going to deal with all the uh, many, many results that will run out um, of your model? Things like that. Keep that just in mind. The code that we are going to use is X Fieldstone, which is based on Fieldstone uh, written by Cedric. Um, and this Fieldstone is an um, educational package for finite element methods. So if you are interested in, in modeling or want to learn something about it, you want to learn specifically about finite element method, I highly recommend you check out Fieldstone because there's lots of exercises. Uh, it's also basically kind of a textbook that's in there, um, a very valuable resource if you want to learn something about geodynamic modeling and finite elements. Another code that I would highly recommend is Aspect. And I just want to highlight that because two of the team members, Julian and Anna, are main developers of Aspect. And Aspect is this big community code um, for mantle dynamics and lithosphere dynamics. And uh, again, it's very easy to start out with it. There's a lot of uh, exercises in the beginning that you can do that you can just check if you get what you're supposed to get. And then once you have built up a bit of confidence and you want to change the model to your specific research needs, uh, there is a very nice community you can get in touch with and that are very helpful. So uh, yeah, I would also, if you would like to do something with geodynamic modeling and you don't really know how to start out, check out Aspect as well. Okay, great. We have chosen a code, excellent. Um, maybe now is a good point to see if it works, verify if it works. Code verification, very important step. The question we ask ourselves is, do we solve the equations correctly? And we can test that in a few ways. First of all, there's analytical solutions, which basically means that you can do the problem by hand and you can get results. And if the computer gives you the same results, the code works. Uh, and these analytical solutions are also sometimes called benchmarks. Of course, the problem is that the first reason why you started to use numerical models was because you couldn't do the problems by hand. So that's a bit difficult because if the model that you're interested in is too complicated to do by hand, then there is no analytical solution. So it becomes hard to verify if the code is still working as intended. So for that, people have come up with community benchmarks, which is basically that um, there is a model setup described somewhere in a high level of detail and other codes or a lot of different codes do that model setup and see if they all get the same results. 
And if all the codes get the same results, it does not necessarily mean that the code is perfect, but at least the entire community is making the same mistakes. So that is something. So as an example, here we have a benchmark of Van Keken in 2008 of subduction. Very simplified. We have a slab that is dipping by 45 degrees. We have an overriding plate that is not moving and we solve for the flow in the wedge, and then we get the following temperature field uh, here in the color bar. And all these different codes in different, uh, uh, different symbols here, um, try and do this model, do this model setup for different resolutions. So this is uh, the more it goes to the left, the higher resolution it is. And in this case, they look at the slab temperature at 60 kilometers depth, which is around here. And you can see that all these codes with high resolution, so with more accuracy, converge more or less to the same solution. So they kind of work. Okay, great. So we did our code verification. We have basically all we need now. We have our physics, we have our model, our model, works to the best of our knowledge. Now we need to make a model setup. So tailor the actual model that we're interested in to our specific research question. And for that, uh, there are a few things to take into account. First of all, you have a philosophy. This is something you should ideally choose as soon as possible, uh, maybe together with your research question as well. Uh, the way we go about it is say that you have either specific modeling, where you see a specific observation or you're interested in a specific region and you want to know what caused the state of that region. Why does it look the way that it looks? So you tinker with your model until you get that result. And then you look back and, oh, okay, these were the things that led to the region being the way that it is. So you, you are basing yourself on very specific observations, really. The other philosophy we call generic modeling, which is more of a generic thing where you're interested in what causes the general behavior of a system. So if you have a subduction zone um, and you have uh, different plate velocities, for example, what changes? How does that change the system? You're not necessarily interested in a specific subduction zone or reproducing a specific observation in a, a subduction zone, but more the general behavior of the system and how the physics all works together. Now, um, as you may remember, our research question was, what is the effect of temperature independent parameters on the thermal structure of subduction zones? And of course, this is quite a generic uh, modeling research question. So what we are going to do in this instance is generic modeling. Of course, there are some overlaps between these two and uh, you know you should never separate it 100%, but generally it's uh, good to know which one uh, philosophy you're in really. Then another thing to look at when you make your model setup is that you should simplify it. Because of course, ideally you would say something about nature, this is the earth, this is a heart. And there are various models of that. You can have very complex models. You can have slightly more simplified models. And then you can have models where you should ask yourself, is that still a heart? Would you recognize it as that? Is that too simplified? It's a very difficult balance to get right, but it is important because you should simplify as much as possible so that you can isolate the things that you're interested in. And this is where modeling is a very powerful tool. You can isolate the process that you're interested in and then study it very well. So therefore you should just you simplify all the other things and get rid of all the complicated things so that you have a clear vision of what is happening with your process. At the same time, uh, you shouldn't make it too simple such that your process disappears or something. So yeah, fine line, but in the end, you know, you, you will get the hang of it. We just want to uh, kind of make that theoretical point. So then what model setup am I considering for my research question? Well, 
we are basing ourselves on the Van Gaken benchmark, uh, which again was this 45 degree dipping subduction zone, highly simplified, of course. Um, it subducts at five centimeters per year, and it has a plate age of 50 million years. There is a stationary overriding plate, and we calculate the mantle flow in the wedge. And again, this is very simplified, but it allows us to use a very well-defined setup. There has been this benchmark. All these codes have gotten the same results. So it's very clear what the output should be. And in this community benchmark, they used constant values for the thermal parameters. So the thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and density. So if we then add our temperature dependent thermal parameters, it will be very clear what the difference is. And we can uh, say something about that uh, in a very isolated uh, case. So great, we have our model set up. So we have our model, but we need to maybe validate if it really works. So where we had code verification before, we tested whether or not we solve the equations correctly. And in model validation, you are checking whether the correct equations are solved and if the model just makes sense really. So at this point, you wanna see, are there any bugs? Are there numerical problems? All the input parameters that you put into your model, do they make sense together? Like, is there internal consistency in terms of thermodynamics? and then testing against observations. Now, I know that I said that observations are kind of, you know, used for specific modeling, but you can, you, sh you should never forget about real world really. So if I say testing against observations, that's also important for generic modeling. If you have a slab that is subducting with 10 meters per year, clearly something is wrong, whether it's specific or generic modeling. So these broad uh, observations you can always check against and you should always check against. As an example of things that could go wrong um, and you should quickly pick up, <laughs> this is an example of uh, one of my models, not the final runs of course, where I uh, messed up the Y coordinates and my plate model here for a 50 million year old plate was uh, upside down. So I, I had a plate at the transition zone, which, you know, uh, was very quickly resolved once I saw this picture. But um, yeah, it's good to have a look before you do your models for real. So you have taken out all these tiny mistakes that you might have made. And now you do need to do some model production runs. So make the actual model, ramp up the resolution so that you can get the best models with the highest degree of accuracy and run all of them to get your results. Now, in our case, what are we going to run? Well, we need to define a parameter space. It's generic modeling. So uh, typically maybe you want to do some kind of parameter study and as I said, we are interested in the temperature dependence of thermal parameters. So that means here we have thermal conductivity, heat capacity, and density. And for reference in orange, I have the constant values that Van Keken used in his community benchmark that we are comparing against. Okay, great. In blue and pink and all these other colors, we have the different lab estimates of how these thermal parameters actually change by temperature. Now, of course, if you look at this, there are a lot of ways in how to combine all these different things. So you can come up with an endless parameter space, which is usually the difficulty that you run into. There's so many things you could test. So you need to make choices about what you actually want to test. Um, and how you can be efficient with your computer resources, for example. So what we are going to do is we are going to test each uh, parameter uh, isolated. So we will test these two different versions of the thermal conductivity, but then we will keep the other thermal parameters constant. Similarly, we are going to test these uh, four uh, 
functions for the heat capacity, but then we'll keep the others constant. And then in the end, our most uh, advanced model, if you will, combines our preferred function for all these different uh, thermal parameters that are all temperature dependent. And then we see the model that comes out. Okay. So uh, in practice, this looks like this, uh, some kind of table that you're probably not interested in, and I don't blame you. Uh, but we can also make it a bit more intuitive, a bit more visual and plot the thermal diffusivity, which is calculated from the three parameters I just shown. So this is the thermal conductivity, density and heat capacity. And then for each of the models that I just described, so we can see how temperature dependent they are. So again, we have constant in orange, so it's just a constant line. And then in blue, we have different thermal connectivities that we test. In uh, green, we have different heat capacities, etc. Okay, great. So we ran all our model production runs now that we know uh, which ones we want to run. And now we need to analyze them. And again, there are some best practices involved. And one of those is visualization. Because of course you want to make a snapshot and look if it's right. Now, in the original benchmark, the snapshots of the temperature field were uh, visualized like this. And we have a diverging color scale. So we have white in the middle, which is usually where you would expect a value of zero or something. And then it would be below zero and above zero, but in this case, it's just kind of a random number. So this is not the most intuitive and not really recommended. If you do not have diverging data, you should not use a diverging color scale. Another thing um, that has been very popular, specifically in, in geodynamics, and also I think beyond that, is the rainbow color scale, because who doesn't love a rainbow? It's vibrant, it's colorful, but actually it's, it's quite bad in the way it represents the data because apparently your eyes are more sensitive to certain color differences. So you could incorrectly uh, look at your data like this, which is of course something we don't want. Also, it's not colorblind friendly at all, or if you want to print it on black and white, it's not going to happen. So again, Rainbow color skill, maybe not the best idea. So then what should you use? Well, here, another member of the team has been very active to say, please use scientific color skills. And these are uh, some examples of his scientific color skills, which you can check out on his website. He also explains there why you should care about scientific color skills, really. Uh, why do our eyes play tricks on us? Why is it important to have inclusive uh, color skills that are also colorblind friendly, etc.? In any case, these are uh, perceptually uniform and uh, colorblind friendly. So that's great. And so we're going to choose one and we're going to choose Oslo because it looks pretty and Oslo is a nice place. Simple as that. So then we get the following snapshot of our model for the reference model. So the one from the community benchmark with a slightly different rheology, but I don't want to get into that. If you have questions, you can ask them later. And um, yeah, this is what it looks like. What does it look like if we have all our temperature dependent thermal parameters? Exciting, it looks like this. And this could very easily turn into a guess the differences game, but I'm just gonna point out that the 800 degree isotherm here ends here and here it's way deeper. And also to make it a little bit more easy, I also plotted the differences between this model and this model. And you can see that most of the differences are actually in the, the overriding plate and the upper mantle wedge. And then there is some differences in the subducting slab. Now we are interested in the subducting slab because that is where we would expect the seismicity uh, where we began from uh, should take place. So um, I'm going to just ignore the wedge for a moment and ramp up the uh, 
uh, limits of the color scale. And then we can see that this is what happens in the slab. We have a 20 degree minus 20 degree uh, uh, isotherm here and a 20 degree one here to show you the differences. And you can see that the top of the slab is much colder if you use temperature dependent thermal parameters and the bottom of the slab is hotter and there can be differences up to 65 degrees. So that's quite significant. Another way of showing this is that uh, is in this figure. Here we have the different models that we ran uh, on the x-axis and it's also listed here. So here's our reference model, our community benchmark, a boundary condition model, which you should not care about, <laughs> uh, thermal conductivity, the different functions, uh, heat capacity, the four different functions, density, and then when we combine all our preferred temperature dependent thermal parameters. Uh, dependent. Yeah, on temperature. Great. So that is the x-axis. And then on the y-axis, we have the depth. And we plot the depth of the 350-degree isotherm, the 450-degree isotherm, and the 600-degree isotherm. Why do we do that? Well, between 350 and 450 degrees, you usually expect the transition from the brittle to the ductile regime. So this is where you would expect the end of the seismogenic zone, the down dip limit of the seismogenic zone. So this is an indication of how deep that would be. And then of course, if you think of the whole seismogenic zone, um, that would change how big the seismogenic zone is in general. And as you can see, this changes quite a bit uh, between the different models. And the 600 degree isotherm is the isotherm associated with dehydration reactions and intermediate depth seismicity. So again, this changes by quite a lot, depending on what you put into your model. So then we have communication. If you have all your results and you have your perfect little research project finished, you should also communicate it, ideally with a very good visualization or a manuscript that is well-structured. We give some tips in the paper as well. And then we have uh, software and data management. How do you deal with all the data that uh, came out of your modeling study? And uh, how do you make sure it's accessible to everyone so that people can easily reproduce your figures and reproduce the things you did, uh, which is of course, a very important part of science, reproducing things, even though uh, it might not lead to the most citations. <laughs> uh, so with that, I kind of want to summarize all the things I've said. Here uh, the team is again. For 101 geodynamic modeling, I hope I have kind of conveyed to you that it's a whole process. It's not just a model setup and the few production runs that you might see in papers. And a lot of assumptions go into these models. And it's always important to view the results in light of the assumptions that went into the models. Because to an extent, these assumptions dictate what you get out of the model. So important to take that into account when you read the geodynamic modeling paper. And then for our specific uh, research question, uh, the effect of temperature dependent parameters on the thermal structure of slabs. We've shown that, well, if you include them, slab temperatures can differ by up to 65 degrees, which is quite a lot. And this then causes the maximum isotherm steps to change. So you can have different estimates of how large your seismogenic zone would be, how large would the biggest megathrust earthquake be that you would expect at a certain subduction zone. And what is the location of dehydration reactions and intermediate depth seismicity. And then uh, I hope I have plugged some of the work of my co-authors during the talk. And I would like to end with two shameless plugs for myself. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, um, I'm looking for a job. So if you want to work with me or you have something going on, this is my email address. Talk to me. I would be delighted. And then second of all, as Tamara already said, I started the YouTube channel in order to find yet another way to do outreach and talk about what it means to work in research really, while keeping a lot of fun 
um, mostly attempts at comedy, really not not true comedy. Um, yeah, so if you uh, write my name in YouTube, you should be able to find that if you want to check it out. And that was all from me, I think. So, yeah. Um, I'm happy to start off the questions. Uh, something that I was wondering, oh, I'll get my video started for you. Something that I was wondering, you said that you start with the ideas come from, you know, observations, nature, and then you run your models through and you found that things might change by 65 degrees. Um, can you then go back to nature and, and test what your model was telling you? Like, how do you, I, I guess I'm asking as a field geologist, <laughs> Who likes who likes observations rather than models? How do you then go back to find out, you know, what's going on? Uh, fair oh. enough. Uh, so, so the way I would approach it is that so first of all, the, the model that we have is very simplified, right? There is no perfectly forty-five degree dipping subduction zone anywhere on Earth. Uh, it's not. It's not happening. Uh, so. Um, first thing to do would be to translate it back to, okay, so what if you actually would have a, like a realistically curving subduction zone? How would that affect, for example, your maximum seismogenic zone? Uh, yeah, with realistic dips of subduction zones. And then I think mostly uh, the way that I would use it or other modelers would use it is if you have a look at um, the different big earthquakes that have occurred uh, in different subduction zones, does that match up? Like where you would expect, um, well, from what you know, what the biggest earthquakes were and what you could then deduce would be the size of the seismogenic zone, does it match up? And then if you have subduction zones where you did not have a very big earthquake yet, but you do have some constraints on the temperature field, what then would be the biggest earthquake that you could expect, for example? Yeah. Um, so that makes sense to me. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. Um, okay. We have a few questions coming in. So first up from Roland Bergman. Um, that was really great. Thanks. Uh, one question that often arises is what level of expertise in the numerical method chosen is needed? Should you not use FEM uh, unless you have taken various classes in engineering departments on the methodology or is a black box approach justifiable as long as you follow the guidance on verification, et cetera, that you put forward? Yeah, so that's exactly why we wanted to write this paper, which is uh, people yeah, often assume that they need a lot of knowledge about coding, for example, but there's all kinds of different um, focuses you can have in your research on the different steps in the modeling process. Some people will love coding and just work on making those numerical methods better and making it more accurate. Other people love the results and interpretation and linking it back to field geology and things like that. So I would highly recommend that you do not need to be an expert on FEM. And I know people who use it as a black box. And I think a lot of people start to do that more, which I think is good because um, as you know, very so, some numerical people very easily lose sight of the actual world because they've never seen it. Well, <laughs> they've never seen rocks, you know, could, could happen. Um, and yeah, I think there's something to be said for both kinds of approaches. And if they work together, that's of course the ideal because then you can learn from each other and make a very strong case for something together. Cool. Um, the next question is from Ling Chen, who says, uh, have you considered the temperature dependent viscosity? Does it also affect the thermal structure of the subduction zone? Right, yeah. Uh, so that is something that I uh, glossed over. <laughs> so uh, in the community benchmark that I showed from Van Keken, they try out exactly this different rheology. So they have a constant viscosity and then they have dislocation creep and diffusion creep, which is both uh, dependent on temperature. And uh, there you see quite big differences. You see bigger differences um, even than uh, the using temperature dependent thermal parameters. So what we did was take the most realistic rheology from that uh, community benchmark paper and then add these temperature dependent 
thermal parameters. So yes, temperature dependent viscosity matters a lot, uh, more so than uh, temperature dependent thermal parameters. Cool, um, and Roland Bergman has said that makes sense from his answer. Uh, so Manel Manelli Giorgio uh, says, brilliant talk, thanks. My question is, how did you manage discontinuous deformation in FEM? Maybe you can just def define what FEM is. Oh, FEM is finite element method. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and then you have FDM, which is uh, finite differences method, and it, it's, it's an abbreviation, yeah. Um, so you don't actually have discontinuous deformation in the finite element method, at least the version that we use here. Um, because all the equations that I showed are based on continuum mechanics. So there is actually no discontinuity anywhere. So if you have uh, things that in, in papers people talk about faults, they will most likely mean shear bands, which is where you have localization of strain. And then because these are our models, we interpret them as that would be faults, but there's no actual discontinuity. Having said that, you do have numerical approaches that uh, also are finite element that include discontinuities. These are, for example, used when you do dynamic rupture modeling and you actually need two planes that, that move discontinuously. And then you have something called discontinuous Galerkin, for example, which is, I don't know, some kind of version of finite elements, I believe that uh, enables you to have uh, discontinuities. Cool, thank you. I'm gonna um, squish two questions together for this one. Um, an anonymous person has asked, what is the relation between rheology and depth? And someone else's uh, Dorian Restrepo has asked, thanks Iris, very interesting talk. Can you give more details on the rheology model that you employed? So details on the rheology model and the relation to, between rheology and depth. Yeah, so, uh, in the end, the rheology model that we employed was uh, using both dislocation creep and diffusion creep together. Um, and uh, so those are temperature dependent. And then the relation between rheology and depth, I mean, I'm not entirely sure how broad to take that. Um, obviously, different rheologies are dominant at different depths. So that is why, for example, if you have an, uh, a lithospheric model, you might only use one type of more simplified rheology, rather than if you do a, a lower mantle model, for example. So, uh, I mean, I guess that is depth. Uh, within the <laughs> small model that uh, we have here, which is just, you know, uh, the upper mantle and uh, the lithosphere, uh, you see that, uh, well, I think that dislocation creep is mostly dominant all the time. Uh, and it, it, it changes, um, it, it varies by temperature. So it, it becomes, the viscosity changes with depth. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> cool, thank you. Um, we have a question from Trish Gregg, uh, who said, uh, Fabio's personal web page is currently down. Is there another location to find the accessible color maps that you've mentioned? I'm not sure if you'll be able to answer that. Um, I, oh, you know. damn. I um, think that Fabio, I think he has a Twitter. Does he? I think I've seen yeah, him. Yeah, he right? does. So you could um, ask him directly. So yeah, theoretically it should not be down, but he has also published papers about this. So if you, I think, I think in something very high impact, uh, nature communications. It's definitely a paper on nature communications. Trish has so just said she's look for Fabio Camiri and I think Grace Shepherd as well. Yeah, she, exactly. I, she said, yeah, <laughs> she found it in the awesome. nature comms paper. Um, she, uh, Trish has also said, uh, excellent presentation of manuscript. I'll definitely use the manuscript in YouTube video of this presentation. Oh, thank you. Good luck. I thought there was a question there. Uh, it's just a thank you. <laughs> um, there are more questions. Uh, let me see. Uh, so Philippe Rosas has said, while modeling subduction, to what extent do you consider preservation of governing dynamic conditions or driving forces should be observed? Um, 
to what extent do you consider? Yeah. Would you agree that all other parameters should emerge from such conditions or do you think that it would be feasible to pre-assume or pre-establish certain velocity BC as in externally forcing the models? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so that's a good question. Uh, I guess the answer is kind of twofold. So you have your conservation equations, mass, momentum, energy, and those should always be observed. But that does not mean that you cannot also prescribe boundary conditions because you you need boundary conditions to solve your conservation equations, especially since we, uh, you know, take a little chunk out of the mantle. Obviously, it's connected to the rest of the mantle, I guess. So, um, yes, you can have boundary conditions and you should have boundary conditions but they should kind of make sense. So if you prescribe velocities everywhere or um, uh, you have material that you forcefully pull out that violates the conservation of mass, for example, then obviously doesn't work. But if you choose or try to choose them sensibly so that you prescribe it somewhere very strictly, but a little bit more loose somewhere else, the entire mass can be conserved within the whole model, and then that would work. So you, you have the conservation equations and you can prescribe the boundary conditions. Uh, they just shouldn't clash. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Constanza Piqueda. Uh, Thanks for the great talk. I was wondering how the pressure dependence of the parameters that you tested might affect the resulting thermal field. Would it counterbalance the effect of temperature? Thus, would it be a valid assumption to take constant values for those parameters, which kind of account for both effects? Mm. Yeah, so we, I don't think we did... Uh, so we don't we didn't do anything with the pressure although of course the temperature changes within the model uh, with depth which you could say is some kind of analog for pressure i guess um uh how the pressure that might affect the resulting thermal field um so i i have to admit i don't know that much about the lab experiments themselves so the things that I read about it, it's mostly that the temperature has the main effect and not necessarily the pressure. So I think the pressure might have an influence, but maybe to a lesser extent. Cool. I think that's good. Uh, we have... Um... Maybe one last question from Kellen Wang, who asks, in subduction zone thermal modeling, the effect of frictional heating along the megathrust often overshadows the effects of many other parameters. What is your thought on this? Yeah, that's a good point. This is something um, we uh, have in the back of our mind to uh, incorporate in the next iteration of this model to have frictional heating as well. Um, at present, uh, yeah, I mean, that could very well be more significant than temperature dependent thermal parameters, which um, I'd love to test. Uh, in our specific model, I think uh, since we also wanted to link to dehydration reactions, um, which is near the, I don't know, deeper depths and 600 degree isotherm, I think the temperature dependence of the thermal parameters is still a little bit more important than maybe any frictional heating because there you do not maybe have that that much. So that is my thought on that. All right, we have one other question that's come through from Chris Rollins. Uh, just once again for myself as a starting grad student 10 years ago, what does dynamic mean in the context of modeling? Yeah. Um, I think it again depends on uh, which community you ask. Uh, so in geodynamic modeling, I'd say it, it means that you're actively solving for the velocities. So what, what is the flow? Uh, if you do kinematic modeling, for example, you prescribe how things move in advance, I think. Although I haven't really done that, so I can't comment on that with great detail. But in dynamic modeling, 
you you want to know how things move uh yeah we also have one other question um that i'm <laughs> sorry maybe this is the last one uh what is the relation between melting and stress that's a very large question perhaps that is a good question i don't know much about melting um although i do know that juliana knows a lot about melting so um you know <laughs> Maybe I should ask her. Uh, I I am not entirely sure. Uh, I do I dare say anything about it? Mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps something to go and go and Google now that we have the background of all your work. <laughs> um, okay, cool. I think that that's all the questions, and we've just hit five p.m. So good to be timely. Um, thank you so much, Iris. Uh, that was brilliant. You're welcome. And I certainly. I like it a lot. lot.